think you should be live now. Okay. Good morning. This is Tuesday. No, it's Wednesday already. God, time flies when you're having fun. Um, it's Wednesday, February 10th, 2021. And uh, this morning we are taking up a bill uh, on probation. Uh, Bryn Hare is the legislative counsel who has done a rewrite of the bill and it can be found on the committee webpage. Um, it is S45 um, and is part of the Justice Reinvestment 2 initiative. Um, so that, uh, hand it over to Bryn. Um, it's draft 1.1, uh, 2921, 11.08 AM, I believe. Is that the one we're talking about? Yes. Good, all right. Um, so there's a bunch of yellow stuff in section one. Yep, so good morning committee for the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. Um, so I just wanted to preface walking through the changes in this, um, in this amendment by saying that um, I think that this draft really reflects <clears throat> an, like the first crack at pulling together some of the threads that um, this committee was talking about in its work on this bill last week. Um, I didn't manage to get this draft out to the witnesses until yesterday afternoon. So um, I didn't have the opportunity to incorporate any feedback of theirs um, okay. into this draft. So I anticipate that the witnesses will have quite a bit of feedback. Um, I myself have some questions about how this would work. So I just really want the committee to take this for the first draft that it is. Okay. Um, so for today in Vermont. <clears throat> I didn't hear you, Senator Nitka. Will you say that again? I should have been muted. I was trying. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. I was just trying to get a copy. I was just trying to look on my phone to get a copy. Oh, yeah. It would it be helpful if I put it put it up on the screen? Probably, yeah. Uh, would that okay. be helpful? Um, yeah. If somebody has a question, I may not see you, so just shout out. And I, um, and as well as those in the. Um, in the audience who are invited to uh, discuss drafts as we mark up bills. Okay, so let me share my screen. <laughs> uh, it's not sharing. There you go. All right. Can everybody see that? Yep. And if I scroll, can you see it scrolling? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, great. So um, as we always do, I put the changes in yellow here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'll just walk through those yellow portions. Please. Uh, and this for the first change that you see in section one, this um, new language in subdivision B, one and two, this was um, a recommendation or this was a suggest some suggested language that was given to me by Judge Grierson. Um, and so the change here um, provides that the sentencing court, this language directs the sentencing court to automatically discharge at the midpoint unless the commissioner seeks a continuation of probation and the court finds by one of these standards of evidence, either clear and convincing evidence or a preponderance of the evidence, that's for the committee to decide that either one of these factors is true in A or B. Termination and discharge will present a risk of danger to the victim of the offense or to the committee, or that the defendant is not in compliance with the conditions of their probation. Bryn? Yes? Just a question. B1 begins with the commissioner recommending, and then one of his options is not to recommend, but to seek a continuation. It seems like there's a um, do we really need, um, I don't know how to put it, but he wouldn't recommend if, if he sought a continuation. Right. So this is, I think this is one of the little language tweaks that need to be made, depending on how the committee comes out on, on this issue. Um, in 252, the section two, 
that's where the directive to the commissioner lies for um, filing the filing the motion to either um, discharge the person from prob probation or to reduce the person's term of probation. Yep. So um, I, I, I look forward to hearing from the witnesses and figuring out how exactly to these directives work, whether the commissioner is required to file and then the court based on the commissioner's recommendation is required to discharge or if the court is going to discharge um, unless the commissioner files um, a motion to continue the probation. So I think, I think there's a little confusion in this draft about um, the commissioner's directives and the court's directives. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm hoping to, that some witness testimony will, will give me some more direction on this. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so I wanted to highlight a different section here that we'll have to decide whether it's clear and convincing or preponderance of the evidence. But um, in B, the defendant is not in compliance with conditions of probation. And then over on page uh, six, on line seven, we have C, which is um, has completed an indeterminate period of rehabilitative or risk reduction programming required as a condition of probation and completed any indeterminate period of programming to the satisfaction of the probation officer. Um, I think that that should be added to, a reference to that should be added to B because it, if, if the only reason the person's, you know, it sounds like is not in compliance would they not be in compliance if they haven't completed programming? So maybe they're, you know, were sentenced to a year of probation and their programming takes nine months. So I don't want it to look like they're not, you know. So if there was either a refer or refer back there or somehow uh, loop that back in here. Okay. Because it looks terrible if you're not in compliance with pro conditions of probation, but it may be you're not in compliance because you haven't completed program. Right. Right. You, yeah. You've just identified another kind of question I had um, about this version of the draft. So I, I do hope that witnesses will weigh in on that piece as well. Okay. Well, we keep walking through. But, okay. Um, so yeah. B2 is the next um, piece of recommended language from Judge Grierson. And this would provide that if the, if the court, um, if the commissioner filed a motion to continue probation, the court has these options. The court can continue probation for the full term or any portion of that term. And the court can also modify the conditions um, for the remainder of the term. Mm -hmm. So now I'm gonna, um, okay. I'm gonna complicate this a little further too, back to my, they could modify the conditions of probation in terms of completing the treatment. If um, let's say one of the conditions of probation was you still attain your GED and it's just been determined that that's impossible for this particular individual given their um, educational background or whatever, um, that they would never be able to do it within a reasonable amount of time. Would that be an ability to change that condition or allow them to be discharged? Right. The way I think the way it's set up now, it sort of gives the court um, the discretion to change conditions as it sees fit. It's not really based on anything as it's drafted now. Could um, it add conditions, though? It looks to me like it modifying conditions. Um, I, I think that language is pretty, pretty broad. So it looks to me like it. Could. I think Senator Benning has a comment or question. Yeah, that was my concern was that this is the court may modify on its own decision without anybody petitioning for a modification. I find that a little bit troubling. Okay. So I'll make a note about that. <clears throat> yeah, I agree with Senator Benning. I'd hate to see them adding things in without any Yeah, keeping in mind that probation came about as a result of a plea agreement or a sentencing, and I, I get a little leery without somebody petitioning the court that the court could actually take it upon itself to just change whatever the original sentence was. Okay. 
<laughs> so we keep yep. going? Yep. So I'm going to skip down now to page um, six, where the we're in section two now. And remember, this is the sub subsection D is the directive to the commissioner to do conduct this midpoint review. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So we've got some um, changes here. So these are um, the circumstances under which the commissioner shall file a motion requesting a dis dismissal of the um, probation term. Mm -hmm. If the offender hasn't violated the conditions, that's A. B is the new one. This is, this is um, the language that carves out certain crimes. So the commissioner shall file a motion for discharge if the person is not serving a sentence for either committing a listed crime, that's 13 BSA 5301, or there was also some talk about um, other more specific crimes rather than the whole list of listed crimes. So I, um, I put in 13 BSA chapter 19, sub chapters six and seven. Those are the domestic assault crimes and the stalking crimes. Or 13 BSA chapter 72, sub chapter one. And those are the sexual assault crimes. Mm -hmm. um, I will note that this doesn't include LNL with a child. That's, um, that's a separate statute. So <clears throat> depending on where the committee wants to go with, with excluding certain crimes, um, we may want to get more complete here. Um, I have a, to me, what crimes we add here determines for me what I choose in the, in whether it's the clear and convincing or preponderance. So for example, for me, if you included L and L with a child, which usually in, by the, um, then I might consider it being clear and convincing because they wouldn't be eligible, correct? Correct, if you included that here, then they would not be eligible. Yeah, but if I don't, then I might wanna go with the other preponderance. It depends on who's included in this group of people who are eligible for this midpoint review or midpoint dismissal, for me. And I'm happy to hear witnesses comment on that. Um, after we finish the walkthrough of this draft. I think they're, all of this is connected. The, the things in on page six are clearly connected to the decisions we make on page one. Right. So the language in C um, is also different. So these are, this is what we've put in to try and address the issue of indeterminate programming. So um, this puts in a requirement that um, the probationer has completed any determinant period of rehabilitative or risk reduction programming that's required as a condition of their probation and that they've completed any indeterminate period of programming to the satisfaction of the probation officer. I know you heard from some witnesses that they didn't like this language. Mm -hmm. um, I put it in with, with the following sentence um, as a way to kind of address that concern about having only the probation officer making that decision, which is that the probation officer shall maintain sufficient records so that the determination of the completion of an indeterminate period of programming may be reviewed by the commissioner and by the court. Um, if you decide to go with that, I think we need to put in some specific language in section one directing the court to actually review um, those records of the probation officer. I just didn't know if this was the direction the committee wanted to take. So um, just a note there that we should put in some more language if, if you do want to go this route. Yeah. Um, as much as on. possible, I don't want to have differences um, in either probation districts and how they do things or probation officers and how they do things entering into this one as much as possible for it to be um, pretty clear. I know I tell you a brief story and years ago, and this is over almost 40 years ago, there was a kid in the program and um, his probation officer was on vacation and the kid did something, I don't remember what, I wasn't there. And they called over probation and parole and the kid um, 
put a bureau up against his door to not let the probation officer into the room. So the probation officer called the police, broke down the door, dragged him off to jail um, on a violation. This, this is a long time ago, but long story short, um, Marty's probably been one of the most successful kids that ever completed the program at 204, notwithstanding what one probation officer did in a really unusual circumstances. Um, and uh, you know, it, just, it, it just worries me when we give that much latitude to individual probation officers to determine these things. I'd like to have it pretty clear cut. Okay, I'm going to keep going. We're just about finished with this uh, with this draft. <clears throat> okay. So, um, subdivision two is the language that directs the commissioner to um, file a motion to request a reduction in the term of probation. And yep. again, I think here we might need to get more specific whether you want to require the commissioner to file a continuance of probation, um, mm -hmm. or if you want to allow them the um, the discretion to request a reduction in term if the probationer doesn't meet the criteria for eligibility um, listed here in subdivision one. So can I just so, ask a question about that? Mm -hmm. So for those persons, would, would a person who's on lifetime supervision be included in that? In other words, that uh, they could make a request to uh, get that person out. I know at one point we were talking about not having the people on lifetime supervision included in this. Right. So these, so these are. This is really the people that are serving um, a specified term. Oh, okay. Um, well, lifetime. She'll review. Yep. Yeah. The language here provides that commissioner has to review everybody serving specified term. So I think um, I would let the witnesses weigh in on that. Um, whether that would be considered a specified term or if it would apply to those people. Okay. Um, so, so I'm gonna move on to subsection three here. So this is that language that provides that if the commissioner um, doesn't file a motion uh, to discharge in accordance with subdivision one or a motion to um, reduce the term in, as provided in subdivision two, or if the court denies the commissioner's motion, then um, it requires the commissioner to conduct a review upon each, like at each point that the probationer completes one of their conditions of probation. And I think that that was a suggestion um, from the department. So that's new language there. <clears throat> and then it provides that if the probationer meets those criteria that we talked about in D1, um, the commissioner has to file a motion requesting uh, dismissal and if the probationer is ineligible pursuant to those criteria, then the commissioner can file a motion requesting reduction in the term. Okay. And then lastly, the new language in subdivision four um, directs the commissioner to make a good faith effort to notify any victims of record um, about any motion that's filed to reduce the probationer's term pursuant to the subsection. Um, so I, may, I imagine you may hear some um, comments on that. Victim sure. notification piece as well. Okay, well, why don't we try to? Are there any questions from the committee? Um, might be a good idea if we could hear from some of the folks in the room with us. I don't know if it's what you call this is in the room. <clears throat> Judge Grierson. Yes, uh, good morning, Senator. Good morning, committee. And thank you for the opportunity to. Uh, speak on S45 for the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. Um, and I apologize for not uh, being able to talk with Bryn um, uh, last night about the draft. The, the first section, she's right that I did make suggestions on that. And the suggestions I made, um, well, let's put it this way, they're not the way the draft reads is not what I had proposed. So there, there's no question there are issues in there. Uh, one of them certainly raised by Senator Baruth that 
needs to be corrected. What my uh, suggestion was, and, and I don't know if any of the other stakeholders agreed with it, was at the midpoint, it basically, the default was that the person would be discharged from probation unless the department uh, moved to con continue the probation. So the way it's written now, it definitely needs to be changed. And I'll be glad to work with Bryn on that. But if you look at the language where it talks about, you, you could leave it as upon the recommendation of the commissioner pursuant to 252. And I believe that's the way the, the department would like to proceed. The court shall terminate the period of probation, discharge the person, unless it shouldn't be the commissioner at that point. It would have to be the state that is opposing the discharge and they would then carry uh, the burden, whatever burden the committee decides is appropriate. So that by just changing uh, the line that says, unless the commissioner seeks a continuation, it would be unless the state or state's attorney uh, seeks. Okay. And I think that would clarify it. And that, I think that would be consistent with what the uh, department would like. When you get into um, the conditions A and B, I think that's consistent with an earlier draft, uh, not in compliance with the conditions. I would agree, um, Senator Sears, with your comment about linking it to the latter part of the, the bill. The conditions um, of probation could include the uh, rehabilitative portion of the sentence. So I, I think that language could be clarified. <laughs> The idea in, in two, in granting the motion, it would essentially be at that point, if, this, if the commissioner is seeking a discharge, it wouldn't be their motion that would be granted. It would be the state's motion uh, to continue probation. So again, that would have to be clarified. Then this authorizes the court or allows the court um, to modify the term of probation at that point, obviously reduce it um, and modify the conditions. Uh, what I had in mind, and I would agree that that language is not clear. It's not to add conditions. It, it would be to reduce conditions that uh, perhaps they've complied with, with uh, conditions and remove those so that it only leaves if probation is not discharged. The idea would be that the person would continue perhaps for a reduced term uh, if it made sense, and on reduced conditions um, because they've complied with them and they're no longer necessary. That, that was the idea behind that section. Yeah. And I can see somebody that has the interlock system that we're driving and then maybe no longer needs that. Exactly. And we take exactly. that off the probation, but continue there, whatever. It, right. It, yeah, the purpose was not to add conditions, but rather to, right. it, it, as we're going forward, you know, reduce the, eliminate the, what are then hopefully unnecessary conditions that were appropriate at the time of sentencing, but because of compliance, they're no longer necessary. Senator hopefully that Sears. clarifies yes. where I was. Sorry, at. Senator Benning. Judge, I just want to make sure um, the way it's worded now says that the court may modify the conditions. I understand that if there is a reduction of the conditions, but leaving it to nope. modify suggests the possibility of, of additional conditions. Nope. I, I, I agree, I Senator. Know your, I know what your intent is. I just want to make sure that whatever the drafting language ends up being, that we are uh, all on the same page that additional conditions can't be added. Otherwise you're, you're interrupting what was a plea agreement. Uh, and that means that the defendant would be entitled to withdraw their plea. I, no, I agree a hundred percent. And that, that was not the intent. And as I said, I'll be glad to rework that. Yeah. I mean, with, uh, with something Brent. like that may reduce or eliminate conditions or remove conditions that are no or longer necessary. Or whatever the language is to make it clear, you can't add right. a new con condition that you um, go to Texas and work on an oil rig. Right. 
so that that was my attempt. Um, but uh, again, I'll be glad to work with Bryn or any other folks to discuss that language. But as written, was not what what I had in mind. Other comments? Um, any other comments on the on the uh, redraft, Judge? Uh, I don't think so, Senator. I'll listen to the uh, witnesses, and if yep. something occurs to me, I'll let you know. But I, I was focusing on that uh, that section of the bill because it of might the be a good involved. time to hear from either Dale or Monica. Thank you. If they're ready. from the Department of Corrections. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. For some reason, my video says it cannot start. Well, we can hear you loud and clear, Dale. So we can give it a try. Okay, I don't know. Um, I see one. Hi, uh, for the record, my name is uh, Dale Crook. I am the Director of Field Services for the Vermont Department of Corrections. Um, <laughs> there, um, what the, the judge just said, we're, we're kind of in agreement um, with that first section. Um, the only additional thing that we would we'd recommend is at the beginning of, of B1 upon the recommendation, um, it really should be when the, a motion to discharge is filed by the commissioner uh, because it's not, it's, it's not so much a recommendation as it's following the statute laid out in previous parts of the section. Um, we do agree with the, the, the judge that the commissioner uh, should not be the one seeking a continuance. Um, that is kind of not our role. I think the, the judge laid that out um, uh, well. Um, another concern that we have in, in, in a practicality, I think uh, Judge Gerson kind of hit on it a little bit is um, reducing a portion of, of the time um, this will be also carried on in, in further sections. Um, it really sets up um, some concerns. Um, it's not very practical. And also I think what uh, Senator Sears mentioned earlier about having different standards from the POs across each office, it would set that up. Um, I will talk about uh, the reasoning behind that later uh, further in this section. Um, as far as uh, the criteria A or B, um, um, below that, it's, it's really a, a policy choice um, the rest of that um, section is fine. Um, then we move uh, toward the end of the bill on page six. Um, as far as B is concerned, I think that's really a policy decision. Um, you know, currently we have a May, our current rule, and in that May, uh, through the rule process, we eliminated sex offenders uh, no. being discharged. Um, but that is really. Um, the department can make any of that criteria work. It's really what the, the committee feels um, comfortable with or what other witnesses feel comfortable with as far as the policy decision on that. Um, as we move to C on page six, I would recommend that we change that first sentence instead of risk reduction programming, that we change it to risk reduction services. The department operates risk reduction programs, and I wouldn't want that to be confused that it had to do that for a discharge. Um, there could be other risk reduction services out there, mental health, um, substance abuse, <laughs> anger management, um, that is not operated by the department. Um, I, think it meets this, I think it meets what the criteria of what the legislation is trying to look for, uh, but will reduce confusion on uh, the departments and in, in everyone that works um, with the department on that area. Uh, on the back end of that section, um, uh, uh, this is different. Uh, this is, um, I, under I think I understand what uh, Bren was trying to do here. Um, we could probably strike out the commissioner, um, but really this is just documentation. This is, this is case documentation um, that we have um, and, and that information or that evidence, so to speak, would be brought if there was a motion <laughs> to object to our recommendation for discharge. Um, the commissioner doesn't need to review, review that. Um, the probation officer operates through the authority of the commissioner. Um, so just strike out the commissioner. That other language is fine. We, we keep case documentation, discharge summaries from treatment providers, et cetera. That's, that's not a burden. Um, on line 13 on page six and number two, this is where I start talking about the 
partial reduction. Um, in practicality, it doesn't it doesn't work out well on a few different reasons. Um, one, this really should be the court determination to reduce the term. Um, they'll, they'll, at, at a hearing, it won't be a probation officer saying he's completed three out of four, so I'm going to reduce his term 25%. Well, someone else could say, well, this was a more important condition that he didn't do, so I'm only going to give him 10%. It, it leads up to a lot of disparities that way. And then in, in operational practicality, it, it doesn't necessarily work, especially with the new language. Um, so if at the midpoint, and I'll give an example. So if at the midpoint review, if we reduce the term because it completed a few of their conditions of supervision, um, we have to do paperwork and follow a motion to the court. The court has to approve, approve it. Um, and that's this the, um, time, and it really doesn't have a lot of impact because once the offender completes the condition, we'd be recommending a discharge. So you have this process that really doesn't have any impact on the offender's sentence, but it will occupy a, a lot of administrative burden for both the department and the courts and possibly the state's attorneys and, and prisoners' rights. Um, on the flip side, if we request a reduction of the probated term, and the offender doesn't complete that condition by the, by the end of the new reduced term, we'd have to file a violation to extend <laughs> the term so they can complete that condition. So it's, it, 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 it kind of, it, it, in practicality, it doesn't, it doesn't really work um, when, when it's moving forward. I'm, I'm almost confused, but um, so if you could help me out, Dale. If the person the person had a two-year term. Um, they still needed something. Wouldn't we be better off to say they'll be reviewed in six months or three months or whatever um, if they are not eligible? So I, I don't think we need a set time to review. Um, the way the, that probation officers will work is they'll be working through the conditions of probation. And with the language that's in there that as soon as these criteria are met, um, we would, so it's almost like a review every time you meet the offender or go through the case. So it's not a set time that we would review it. That could actually extend it if, if we wait every three or six months. Um, it could be two months longer than we actually would need to, to submit the discharge. Okay. Um, if I didn't explain that well, I'll try to um, maybe do a case that I could walk through that might make more sense. I don't want to confuse um, well, I am confused. <laughs> I'm confused. All right. So I'll have a, I'll do a straightforward example. Let's say an individual has a two-year term of probation, and he has four conditions to do. And at the midpoint review, he has completed three out of the four. So the probation officer say, well, let's reduce it 25% because he did 75% of the conditions, and we reduce it by six months. All right. Everyone approves that reduction. He now has an 18 month term. Now, if that offender completes all his conditions the following month, we, we are required to file for a discharge. Um, so that motion to reduce the term was just an administrative burden that really has no impact on the case. Then on the flip side, whenever the offender completes his terms, we would file for a discharge. <laughs> Unless the offender doesn't complete the, the, the the uh, required last condition, and we're getting toward the end of the term, the new reduced term, we'd have to file a violation because he's not in compliance with his probation in order to extend the term so the offender can complete the term. Did that add some clarity? Yep. Okay. Yep. Does it mean that when we file a discharge that the court, when it gets reviewed, if the state's attorneys objects, they can make that determination to reduce the term? It should not be on the probation officer. I think that opens up for a few other um, disparities that I think the, that, that the senator was looking to avoid. Um, um, as we, uh, so that takes care of two and kind of three as well. It's that same partial reduction of language. On page seven, number four, um, the notification of the victims um, of record, that really is the state's attorney's responsibility. Um, doesn't mean the department doesn't work with victims, um, but that is really on the state's attorneys. I think that's the current practice now. Um, in addition, I'm not sure a rule is necessary um, for this, this section uh, or for this um, amendment because it lays out pretty clearly what the department is supposed to do. 
Um, the, the the rule would basically just be regurgitating what the statute is laid out. Um, there's not really a lot of decision points for the department to to, to make in a rule. Um, and in addition, otherwise we'd have to file an emergency rule and update the rule and go through that process because rulemaking takes uh, more time than to be effective on, on July 1st. So the department actually would be recommending to strike uh, number four, um, the rule. Any questions? No, I think it's clearer now for me. By the way, Senator White is not here. She um, had uh, announced she had to go to Grace Cottage for over the 19 vaccinations. That's where she is. <clears throat> Since she announced it publicly yesterday, I thought I'd be able to announce it about three today. Um, who would like to go next? Maybe um, anybody. <laughs> Mr. Attorney General? Assistant Attorney General? Under general, there's the assistant attorney general. I stop committee. calling you an attorney general until you uh, make make your current boss a little nervous. <laughs> um, morning, Senator. You know, I think that I, I actually defer to some of the other folks on the call who may have more operational input. I think that. Um, the drafts, uh, the draft is moving towards taking care of some of the concerns that we had regarding uh, programming. Um, the definitions look like in terms of the determinate uh, programming and indeterminate programming, I actually think we're getting towards a solution here in terms of uh, what we're looking for with respect to making sure that people <laughs> are continuing probation who need to, but there's also the flexibility to uh, uh, make sure we're not holding people past where they need to. I think that some of the other folks who have more granular knowledge on um, how this stuff works will be more helpful to you at this point in terms of ironing out the language. It sounded like Judge Pearson and, and um, Dale Crook already made some good suggestions for tweaks to make it workable, but uh, for now I'll, I'll sit back and let some of the other practitioners weigh in on some of the detail aspects of it. And the overall goal, goal remains to get people off probation that don't, don't need to be on probation. That's right. And I do I, I, I do support where this is going. I think that the draft has is, at least in concept, is getting towards solving a bunch of the sticking points that we had. Matt or Pepper, either one of you. Matt, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I'd like to bring you back, obviously, to our start at section one um, the uh, some of this has been brought up um, but I think that uh, you end up in a situation with I'm, I'm looking at B where the defendant is not in compliance with conditions of probation um, sometimes in plea agreements you end up with surplusage when it comes to conditions of probation that you ultimately, they, they aren't really relevant to the uh, specific crime, even though the law says that they're supposed to be. And that is something that you end up determining along the way. It's, it's one of these things that defendants get hung up on conditions that aren't really relevant to their rehabilitation or to the crime. Um, and they may not be in compliance with them. Sometimes there are things like driving conditions um, or, um, or certain types of employment conditions and, and the like. Um, I, th I don't mind if that is in there, but I would suggest that there be a sub C where the court could find that there's no further need um, to continue the person on probation because um, the court can look at the facts as a whole and just say there's not a risk to the public and while this defendant is not in compliance to the with the all of their conditions of probation 
there's no further need to continue this person on probation. Um, and so I would suggest that there be a catch-all that allows the court to discharge people who aren't necessarily fully in compliance, but have met the, um, the uh, risk um, and danger prong of, of the uh, conditions. One of the things that uh, I think I'd love to have the legislature make a statement on this, which is that pro probation should not be used for punishment purposes. Probation should be used for um, rehabilitative, restorative purposes, um, and focusing on those concepts. Um, if somebody needs, is going to be punished per se, then they're, they're probably going to end up uh, confined somewhere, whether it's a you know, 24 hour curfew or, or something on probation or, if the, or which I've seen on occasion, not very often. Um, it, it's a little bit of a shame that home confinement went away, um, but the, uh, they're gonna spend some time in, in a, a facility or a work camp or something like that. Um, and uh, um, the concept is to try to get people off probation who don't need to be on and that we shouldn't be holding people for punishment purposes only um, on probation. I agree with the discussions that have been had about uh, modifying conditions. Um, a probation deal in a plea agreement is a contract that is, uh, uh, has to be upheld by both sides. And if you modify the terms of the contract, then you end up in a situation where a person could um, File, could uh, withdraw their plea or file post-conviction relief um, to get the agreement uh, vacated. The conditions could be modified and they have been, are modified somewhat regularly by agreement of the uh, parties. Senator Benning or had a comment or question, Matt. Yeah, before you leave page one, Matt, um, right. if we added a catch-all subsection C, the line on the or line 16, we were trying to decide between clear and convincing and a preponderance of the evidence. Does that make a difference if that catch-all phrase is added as to which of those two clauses you'd be happier with? Well, see, now we're, this is interesting because I, I hadn't thought of the concept that Senator Sears brought up earlier as conditioning the types of crimes that it would be, uh, um, the subject of this to whether or not one standard or the other applies. So there's that level of it. Um, and, uh, and now you're asking me about on a different issue. Uh, I, I have a general feeling about this and I think it, even reasonable defense lawyers could disagree about this one. Um, personally, I'd rather have a preponderance standard and exclude um, a bunch of crimes except for the most serious ones rather than uh, um, a clear and convincing standard and um, and uh, I, I think I've said that backwards. I think there's. I think there's a robocall in somebody's background. Oh, so Could they mute? really wants to know if my uh, auto warranty yeah. has expired oh. yet? Um, well, if you'd like to testify on Friday about your auto warranty, we're taking up robocalls sure. Friday morning. I, I only I only get uh, ten calls like that a day. I do have certain glee in picking it up and just hanging it up on them, but in any event, um, yeah, I mean. I, I think I would rather exclude, you know, to, to Senator Sears' earlier point, I'd rather exclude crimes from, uh, um, you know, limit this to a small number of uh, um, serious uh, crimes and go with a lower standard. Um, but I can see how people might disagree with that. I think the court will make, I think, the court, if it wants to come to a conclusion, will make findings of whatever the conclusion it is to get to where they want to get. But if they're prevented from making those decisions regarding 
what they can consider, then the standard of proof doesn't mean as much. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yep. Um, so that, that's at least on that issue. Um, I, I again, I'd, I'd, I don't know if it's a matter of if it could be part of legislative history, but uh, a, a, a statement regarding what probation should be. Uh, we can always do a finding, although usually the House does findings, but we can do a finding or a uh, statement of purpose of probation. There, there have been many times over the years where I've had people, in, and there's actually not in statute any, any real uh, support for this. You're either on probation or you're discharged from probation, but I've had many cases where um, They've been on for a period of time. They didn't get everything done, but they aren't causing any more trouble. They aren't committing any more crimes, but they didn't quote unquote do everything that we want you to do. And they get quote unquote unsatisfactorily, unsatisfactorily discharged. Um, there's actually in statute no, nothing that says there's such a thing as unsatisfact, discharge, unsatisfactory discharge. Um, and you know, it may, it may be buried in DOC rules somewhere that I'm, I'm not aware of, but, um, you know, this is akin to that, which is basically saying, look, you've done the relevant parts of what we need you to do. And while you haven't complied with everything, um, we're still going to discharge you because there's no point in carrying you on probation anymore, or you being part of this. Um, well, there is a point where you've gotten all you can get. Exactly. And really what you want is people not to be committing new crimes. And if that is the case, then, then it doesn't matter what the probation conditions are. Exactly. exactly. Uh, I, I think um, if, um, Bryn, um, if we could make some statement regarding probation should not be used, is not, um, well, rather than should not be used, probation should not be seen as a punishment, but rather a conditions that make positive changes like that for rehabilitation or I hate the word rehabilitation you know <clears throat> but I'm thinking of those that that all they can get out of the yeah. probationary sentence they may not be successful to you and I but they've done well I mean, Yep, I can add a section that does that. All right. Um, all right, so I'm skipping down to uh, section two. Two fifty two B. Well, it's it's where the obviously where it's. I don't know if you highlighted or I did. Because uh, I have all these notes on the side, but it's basically making decisions between what's going to be included. Um, I'm not against having the department be able to make this work in the manner that <clears throat> is easiest for them to track um, and make sense with current procedure so they don't have to be rewriting a bunch of rules. Um, the, and I'm mindful of what Senator Sear, Sears has said about leaving too much to the discretion of, the, of a probation officer in determining whether somebody has satisfactorily completed um, a certain programming. What I'm con what is confusing me? I, I know what a term probation is, and I know what indeterminate probation is. What I don't understand, honestly, is what determinate programming versus indeterminate programming means, because that's not a term that we particularly use. Um, are we talking like, you know, AA might be for life. Um, d domestic violence programming, um, you know, the 
batter's intervention programming might be some number of weeks. Um, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't understand what we're talking about there um, when we're talking about indeterminate programming versus term type programming. Can anybody uh, is maybe. I don't know if Dale, uh, did Dale introduce that terminology to us? I, I don't, I don't know. So I, um, I don't think that I got that language specifically from any one of the witnesses. It, that was my attempt to capture what was being talked about with different kinds of programming. <laughs> Just like you mentioned, there are some types of programs that a person continues on and others that have actually like a six month completion date. Um, so, that was me trying to capture that. And if there's a better way to do it, I would be glad to. Yeah. I, what I don't want to get hap, have happen here, this bill is designed to get the vast majority of people off probation that don't need to be on probation any longer by requiring the midpoint review. And I don't want to lose sight of that. And that's the goal here. Um, and I, I'm afraid sometimes, the, yeah. Um, so I, I'm, as much as possible. It should be either completed the, the, I hate the word completed. You participated in the programming you were required to participate in. And Matt, you make a good point. AA is for life. Other treatments are more long term. So, all right. I, you know, maybe we could, there's some way to, maybe that just has to get out of there yeah. somehow. Um, and yeah, the goal, I mean, I think we need to make sure we don't do things that hinder the goal of the bill, which is to get people off probation that don't need to be on it. Um, all right. There was, uh, Dale was talking about in, in sub three of this section, the idea the that the commissioner filing a motion reduction of term regarding probation, again, um, if the, and he was, so if there's a modif, I'm trying to get to what this is. If there's a modification at a midpoint review or a denial at a midpoint review, there's going to be reviews down the road and Dale, I think, suggested that if there wasn't compliance, then the, the department would have to file a violation, um, even if the person didn't pose a risk. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't understanding that because I couldn't they file a motion again with the court? In, with, first of all, they could always discharge um, whether it's satisfactory or not. Um, and they could always request a modification of conditions, which would better suit the person rather than filing, or they could file a violation if one is warranted. Um, so I think there are options besides just filing violations unless I'm misunderstanding what Dale was trying to get at. Dale, do you want to comment? If, if, um, I'm just trying to think of an example. Let's say um, someone's taking BEP and they didn't start enroll in BEP until, let's say, the midpoint review. Um, they may, if we did a reduction of term, they may not complete that programming in time. In order to do that, we'd have to extend that term. So, so they'd be in compliance with their condition. Um, while if if they did have time, once they completed the term, we once they completed the BEP or the programming, 
we would just file a by um, a motion to discharge. It's then as an added layer to extend and move the the midpoint or the the term ending um, that really would create confusion, and that really should be on the court's end um, if they want to reduce the term and not the department making a re recommendation. It starts getting really confusing for staff where everyone's going to have a different barometer where everyone doesn't want individual POs and offices making individual decisions. Some may say that condition is worth six months. Some may say three months. Some may say um, whatever. So I think that whole reduction of term and then the fact that we have to, that it could be mute out and many options, it just adds burden to the system that doesn't need any more administrative burden added to it. Okay, so it's not that there aren't things that are doable, it's just there you see an administrative burden. And I, I get that. I mean, nobody wants to add more to what they're... But I don't, see it, I don't see it providing a benefit. So if I file a motion to reduce the term and then a month later the offender completes the condition that we reduce the term on, then we'd file a discharge to end the term, to end the You're probation. You're concerned about this in counties, particularly where there's a lack of availability of services. So, you know, the BIT program only comes up so often, or, I mean, is that where you're seeing this being a big issue? I'm, I'm just trying to understand. Because you might get on probation and then the next program doesn't start for, you can't get in it for six months. Um, and so that nobody's not in, they're not, not in compliance, but they are, unable to access the service that they need. There could be many reasons why they don't complete. Maybe someone has three different types of conditions and they can only do one condition at a time and it just takes them longer to have it completed because they're working and doing other things. So it's really, um, you know, what the goal is, I think, is once someone completes their conditions um, as an incentive, we want to discharge them from probation. Um, and I think that's where we want our time focused on. Yeah, we, we basically don't want people doing effectively dead time on probation with just being on probation with nothing left to do. Okay. Um, for me, I guess the only other thing to, to you know, to talk about is, uh, you know, what crimes might be, uh, might be on the list to be excluded um, and the, again, I would obviously prefer, prefer there be a shorter list and a, um, preponderance standard for, uh, for burden of proof. Um, the, I, this is, it's always one of those ones. I think it's because of the the words that are used, you know, lewd lascivious conduct with a child was one that was, I think, proposed to still be on the air, even though sexual assault on a minor involving two individuals who were of similar age um, was not going to be on the list. But the same, that same uh, period of time applies to Eleanor with a child as well. So I, I if you're going to do sexual assault consensual between minors, then you should do the same thing with, you know, exclude that from uh, from the from not being able to do this. Then you should do the same thing with the L and L with a child under the same circumstances. I think that's all I have, but I'm sure I'll think of other things as uh, this evolves. Yeah. How do you deal with split sentences? I'm thinking of those types of uh, crimes. Well, I mean, that's a very common thing. So, you know, they're going to end up doing doing time, whatever it is, and, and then they're going to have some amount of their sentence that is going to be, <clears throat> as you said, split to serve on probation. And um, I think you just look at it halfway through what if, <clears throat> whatever that term is. All right. So, you know, um, I mean, if you're doing, uh, you know, two to 10, all suspended on probation, except for uh, two to serve, then you're probably going to look at them at five years and see where they're at. 
So I think you could eliminate anybody who's on lifetime supervision. That would be the... Yeah, I, I, that's... Yeah, anybody who has an indeterminate life sentence uh, might be one, ex again, except for, to me, those that have the consensual element of minors in the sex cases. You, but the uh, there's that other group that just says, until further order of the court, which in theory could be life, but uh, is... Uh, uh, but he's, you know, is not an indeterminate life sentence by statute. No. Okay. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, who would like to go next? Who, whoever would like to comment? Um, maybe Pepper. Um. Sure. Thank you. Uh, for the record, James Pepper, Department of State Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, I think this bill, again, is moving in the right direction. Um, it sounds to me like all of the people that have spoken today and have spoken offline are in agreement with the underlying principle that the midpoint review should be strengthened and that people that no longer need um, the kind of supervision of the court um, should be removed from probation. Um, we have, uh, you know, I think I should just focus mostly on section one because it sounds like section two, um, there's general agreement, but there needs to be some um, kind of cleanup or clarification in some of those sections that I think, you know, we're all pulling in the same direction there. But uh, with respect to uh, the, the first section, um, and this is when, you know, there's been a motion filed by corrections and it's now within the court process. Um, I would agree with Judge Grierson that, you know, it should be the state that's seeking a continuation of probation, not the commissioner of corrections. Um, I would agree with Matt uh, Valerio that we, I think the state's attorneys would prefer the preponderance of the ev evidence standard here with, um, and having it, having the exclusions apply to fewer crimes. Because I think that what we have mostly been concerned about are the, super, the supervision conditions that are related to victim safety and uh, victim uh, harassment, victim contact. And so if that's an issue, I would want the court to have uh, the ability to not have to face, I would not want the court to be faced with a decision where they must discharge because there wasn't clear and convincing evidence of a victim issue. Um, but I would like them to go down to that second part uh, of section one, which is this is a good opportunity to review and modify the conditions and maybe get rid of the, you know, no ignition interlock, maybe get rid of the curfew or some of the other conditions that aren't really related to victims or, or reduce the term. And so that, that's why uh, we, would prefer the preponderance standard here. Um, Senator Sears? Yeah. Um, James, Matt had suggested a catch-all phrase, uh, basically allowing the court to make another determination altogether, but that would also, if we plug that in here, you understand with a preponderance of the evidence standard, that standard would apply to that catch-all phrase as well? So I wasn't, uh, you know, I hadn't considered the catch-all phrase until Matt uh, Valerio just brought it up. Uh, I'm not, I don't believe that the state attorneys would support that catch-all phrase right there, mostly because what he was saying is that compliance with conditions should not be a prerequisite for discharge. And compliance with conditions um, I think when you're out on probation, you're kind of on a, a trial period with the court. And if you're not complying with your conditions, um, then I think that that should indicate that maybe uh, discharge isn't appropriate at this time. And, you know, when Matt suggested that um, some conditions aren't relevant to the crime, you know, I, I, I work in my summers and, you know, in the appellate division of our, and, you know, we frequently are litigating cases about 
conditions not being, they're not being a nexus to the crime and they're dropped uh, very frequently. Um, so there is a remedy for folks that have, you know, overbroad conditions or conditions well, that me, don't. Let me give you an example. If uh, one of the conditions, one of the standard conditions of probation is that you meet with your probation officer when and where as directed. And if there was a planned uh, meeting with the probation officer that was missed, the, uh, the offense of that did not rise to the level of the probation officer deciding to file a violation. But technically he is, the probationer is not in compliance with what has been suggested. Um, and the way these two provisions A and B are right now as I read them, if he's not in compliance with conditions of probation, B would knock him out of being eligible for this remedy. The, so, the way, sorry. Well, I, I see Matt's suggestion of a catch-all phrase that um, a, a court could look at and say, you know, they've done what we really wanted them to do. They may not technically be in compliance as a result of having missed this particular meeting, but why are we going to keep them on probation? And I saw the wisdom in Matt's suggestion. I understand you're objecting to it. I'm throwing you back that example as something that I could foresee being used to deny somebody in this circumstance. Well, so the, the denial that would occur if you added a subsection C would be um, just related to discharge. So a person that, uh, the, the individual that you're discussing would still have a remedy here in that the, you know there could be a decision by the court not to discharge, but to reduce and modify. And I know that there's some concerns around the, the term modification and there should be some clarification because again, we're all on the same page here that this should be a reduction of either the term or the conditions or both. But that, um, but that if someone is not compliant with their conditions, I think that should, that should indicate that maybe discharge is not appropriate, but that a modification would, could be appropriate. And that would still be allowed under um, subsection two. So it, it's just, it, it's, a, it's just one, one of those disagreements that I think that we have that, you know, a modification is likely appropriate if someone, if potentially someone is not complying with their conditions. And of course it depends on what those conditions are um, but that, you know, this bill allows an avenue towards a significant reduction or, uh, you know, or a modification um, of terms, even for those folks that are not compliant with conditions. Seems to me reading it that they would still be denied the ability to get off probation under those circumstances if we left it the way it is court doesn't have an option. They can modify the conditions, but they're still not eligible for getting off probation at that point. If they're not compliant, right. Yeah, and if, it, if they're not compliant with a standard condition of meeting with their probation officer when and where as directed, um, I, I can see that being a snag under the way this is currently worded. Well, Brent. Can I weigh in here for a minute? If we Please. if we change that language in subdivision B on the top of page two to tie it um, more closely to the language in the second section about that programming, it then it, the language won't be in compliance with conditions of probation. It will it will actually be um, more specifically tied to their programming. Um, and so would that would that solve the the problem here, or I've it helps. It helps. <clears throat> For some reason, I keep going back to one individual who um, became infamous and you know led to Act One and twenty ten or eleven. It might have been twenty oh nine. Doesn't matter. Act One was following the murder of Brooke Bennett, and you know the. The evidence that we gathered about Michael Jakes on probation would lead me to believe that whatever we do, 
Um, there, the individual probation officer decided not to violate because he didn't recognize the red flags that were being thrown up there. The guy had gone out of state when he wasn't supposed to. He didn't have his White River Junction. I mean, uh, whatever that, Lebanon, Vermont, or, uh, Lebanon, New Hampshire, or whatever it was. Um, there were a lot of red flags, and I think as much as possible, we want to leave the discretion to the court, uh, but not uh, <clears throat> just another thing I get uncomfortable with here. Dick, I agree with your uh, lack of comfort in the case of a worst case scenario but it's a pretty standard thing in my business for somebody on probation to miss a meeting with their probation officer. And that's one of the standard conditions of probation. So everybody's gonna have that responsibility. And as I read it right now, if they're going to be released at the midpoint, um, the only way that can happen is if they are in compliance with the conditions of probation. So technically they're not. And I'm, I'm thinking that the court ought to have some kind of an override where it sees that the infraction is really de minimis and we don't keep them on probation simply because they may have missed uh, an appointment and a probation officer hasn't deemed that a violation of probation. Sir, if I may, this is a... Yep. Um, but understand, I, the, the decision, uh, we're not concerned. I'm just trying to give them information that the department will not file the discharge um, if they've been found in violation by the court within the previous six months. So, so the situation that Senator Benning is talking about, unless we file a violation in court and the judge upholds that violation, then we would be submitting a discharge. Um, as far as what language you use, it's, it's not a concern. It's just trying to, to, to help the committee by understanding that you have to be in no violations for six months before we even file the discharge. Well, Dale, the way that I read this now, the intent is to get somebody off of probation at the midpoint. Unless the court um, finds one of these two things. Now, if the court asks the question, um, has the defendant complied with his conditions that require him to meet with a probation officer? Even if the probation officer has not filed a violation, the probation officer, assuming they're telling the truth, would say, well, they've made six out of 10 planned meetings. Is that person in compliance with conditions of probation? I would submit it doesn't sound like it to me. And I don't want that to be a hang up if probation has never decided that that alone was worthy of a violation to be filed. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking that the catch-all provision that Matt was suggesting made some sense to me and I'm gonna leave it at that. If you, if you don't mind that. The, no, I don't. The ones that I um, am wary of are conditions that you maintain stable employment and stable housing. And uh, while the person may not be uh, committing any crimes and they might be doing their programming, um, they may also, in the course of a year, change houses some number of times and they may lose their job through no fault of their own or would end up changing jobs or that kind of thing. And so it's the kind of the stability of your, of the things that are outside of your control um, that uh, may give rise to, uh, you know, questions about compliance that are not, uh, um, you know, even even something is like, you know, having it maintaining a, a phone or something. Um, the uh, those types of uh, those types of things um, concern me, and, and uh, what uh, Senator Benning was talking about is, a, is another typical kind of thing, making all your meetings, that sort of thing. Um, you know, to me, as long as you are not committing crimes and that you're you are attending your, you've done your programming, some of these other things that are difficult for even people who are not on probation, if you are, um, 
you know, on the lower economic uh, rungs of our society, uh, you, uh, they, they should not be the thing that keeps you on probation. How about a word like, how about the defendant is not in substantial compliance with conditions of probation? Senator, if, if I may throw in a suggestion that hopefully is helpful and not. No. Um, looking at the, uh, you know, the way the mechanism is working, as I see it, is basically the way the court gets these is through a recommendation from the commissioner. And so what we're really arguing about, and we could change that mechanism, but the way the statute is currently set up, that's the concept here. And so you have to go down to page five and six to see what are the triggering things that are going to send this, that the commission that is going to require the commissioner to send this to the court. And so there's, there's two, well, one important point that I think Dale was, was making, which is that I read subdivision A on the, at the very top of page six uh -huh. to be limited only to those cases where there was a VOP where, that somebody was adjudicated in court for a violation of probation. So not that somebody was not in compliance and the department knows about that. They didn't show up to a meeting. They were having trouble maintaining housing, but that there had to been a violation of probation filed with a court and an adjudication of guilt found on that, which is quite a bit different, I think, than the sort of, and, and a higher bar. And frankly, policy-wise, good, because that limits the discretion of the department and means that more of these cases are going to be going to the court. So I'm not, so I think that we're talking about a fairly limited um, issue here and that it's only if the VOP has been filed and adjudicated guilty by a court. So there already was a judge who had to have said you're in violation, not just that a probation officer thinks that they're in violation um, before. And so in, unless that pretty serious process has been fulfilled with some serious due process protections, um, this is going to be filed with the court as long as the other two, B and C, have also been met. The other thing I would suggest, and I realize the department may not be uh, okay with this, but I'll throw it out there as a suggestion, is another additional protection you could have is to basically say, hey, if you meet the conditions of D1, uh, which is contained on pages five and six, you know, the, the thing shall be filed. But under subsection two, you could still give the court, you could give the commissioner the discretion to say, you want, you could request the reduction term of probation or request dismissal. Um, so basically it's like D1 is a shall, you meet those conditions, you, you get the recommendation and then the court checks it according to the, things on page one and two, or you don't meet the conditions of D1, it's no longer a shall, but the commissioner still has the discretion to say, well, you know, that VOP we filed was adjudicated five and a half months ago, there's been no issues. Technically they don't meet D1, but this still gives the discretion to say, you can either mm -hmm. reduce the term or, or discharge. So those are a couple thoughts that I have uh, on that issue, hopefully productive. Oh, but maybe not. No, I think so. Um, anybody else would like to speak that hasn't so far? The, the network is here, Chris Fennell's here. Um, we haven't heard from them and we haven't heard from uh, Monica if she has anything to add. Uh, Chris, join yes. us. For the record, Chris Fenno from the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. Um, very interesting conversation so far. and. I would say uh, that the, the things that are being suggested are ones that we would support. Um, again, going back to that issue about clear and convincing or preponderance, we fall on the preponderance side, um, that dealing with risk to the public is an important thing. Um, and so that that needs to be clear that the defendant does not pose a risk. Um, in terms of the modification, just wondering, I, I agree a couple of people have spoken today and, and the other day that the subjective nature <clears throat> of a probation officer um, 
is, I think, confusing to trying to get fairness across the board. Um, so I would suggest sort of meaningful, measurable, and specific criteria to be used. For instance, and we've talked about this too, completed programming. Take out that piece of successful. Um, we're in favor of that. Um, and then finally, and I, I didn't have time to look this up, but I'm sure somewhere in statute, there is a definition of good faith effort. And my concern is that good faith effort um, looks different from one place to another. And just to make sure that there are sort of parameters around what that means. Um, and those really are, are our only concerns at this point. Thank you. Any questions for Chris? Thank you. Jess, Jessica, hi. Hi all, thanks for having me. Um, Jessica Barquis from the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. And I will just agree with many who have come before me and say that I think this bill is headed in the right direction. And we um, definitely support many of the changes that have been made. Um, I support the added language that strengthens the victim notification. I think that is really important. Um, and like Chris and others have said before, I would also support um, the preponderance standard and excluding more of the crimes from the um, carve out than um, the clear and convincing standard. So thank you so much for taking the time to make these changes. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else who wants to comment before we take a break? Um, one thing I'd like to consider adding is um, many states cap probation for misdemeanors at two years. Um, Alabama, Georgia, Hawaii, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, uh, the list goes on, New Hampshire, um, Delaware, Indiana, and Maine cap it at one year for misdemeanors. Um, I'm wondering if we uh, were able to put a section in and ask for a report from Sentencing Commission to Justice Oversight recommendation about whether the mod should cap probation for misdemeanors. Makes sense to me. <clears throat> um, we, at the same time as this was being done, as this bill was being drafted, um, there was a Pew uh, study December 2020. Um, regarding a number of things regarding probation. And we're, we're in pretty well in good company, but we have indeterminate um, probation terms, even for misdemeanors. And we're only with Florida, Massachusetts, South Dakota, and Virginia in that category. Um, I don't want to get into felony right now. That gets a little more complex. Anything else before we take a break? Yeah, well, one more thing, sir. This yes, sir. A, of course, from the department. Um, we, we did hear what um, the, the network said and, and the other uh, issues. The concern is still with the good faith effort being placed on the department. That would be an added responsibility. Our victim service specialists, we currently have three in the department and their primary function is to work with offenders being released with the victims to make sure that there's safety plans and notifications going out when our offenders are released. Um, we do believe that the victim should be notified, but this, this responsibility currently lies with the state's attorneys and we would like to suggest that it remains with the state's attorneys um, at this point. Okay, all right. Um... When we get back, we're going to take up S18, which is the earn time bill, and then um, and then come back to this at 11:30. Um, we may not be ready to vote, but uh, 
if we are great, if we aren't, okay. Um, we may need to, to chat a little more amongst ourselves. And, uh, um, but um, Eric is, uh, Peggy has posted um, a uh, redraft of S18, the earn time bill and on the video page. And Chris Fenno has a statement uh, on that as well. If you're looking at it. We'll be back at 1045 and we're going to end the live stream. Um, but those who are watching on YouTube can catch us back at 1045.